Hi, I'm Jeff Groh. Welcome back to Calculus 2. Today we're going to talk about parametric curves. When you think about some curve in the plane, it is a, an object that has one dimension. In one dimension, you can only go forwards and backwards along the object. It's an object in one dimension, embedded in this case, in a two-dimensional space. We can describe points on this object as functions of some additional parameter. And as t moves along, we might move to different points along the curve. And so parametric curves will have an orientation. We'll give x as some function of the parameter t and y as some function of the parameter t. The parameter doesn't have to be called t. It could be called anything. We could give x as a function of theta or x as a function of some parameter psi. Whatever it may be, just some additional variable. If R2 consists of points x, y, so that both x and y are real numbers, these describe the points throughout the plane. We talk about the plane R2. So by definition, a parametric curve in R2 is a of functions at x mapping some interval into R, y mapping the same interval into R. Here we're assuming that i is a subset of the set of natural numbers and is an interval. To be an actual parametric curve, we need to assume that these functions are continuous. In this way, these functions don't go from one point to another without some intervening path connecting them. Let me give you an example. Suppose I have the curve x squared plus y squared equals, say, 9. One possible parametric equation representing, one possible parametric representation of this curve is the set of parametric equations 3 times the cosine of t, y equals 3 times the sine of t. You can see that if you write this as x divided by 3 is cosine t, y divided by 3 is sine t, then x squared over 9 plus y squared over 9 will be cosine squared t plus sine squared t, which is identically 1. It follows then that this system of parametric equations represents a parameterization of this curve. As you've seen though, parameterizations have an orientation, a direction in which the curve is swept out. In this particular instance, when t is equal to zero, x is three and y is zero, placing the curve right here at t equals zero. If t is a small but positive angle in the first quadrant, then both x and y will be positive, putting us somewhere up here. You can see then that this curve will be a circle that travels around the origin in a counterclockwise fashion. I want you to pay special attention to what I just said. It's traveling in a counterclockwise fashion. A different parameterization would have been, say, x equals 3 sine t, y equals 3 
cosine t. This would have worked just as well. It would have had a different orientation, however. You can see that when t is equal to 0, x is 0 and y is 3. And when t is in the first quadrant, both x and y are positive. That implies, then, that this curve traverses around the origin in a clockwise fashion, starting in the 12 o'clock position. Suppose I have x equals t squared minus 9, y equals t. t goes from, let's say, negative 1 to 3. Can we graph this curve? One thing you should note is that if y is equal to t, you can plug y in and place a t above. And so we're looking at x equals y squared minus 9. Moving the 9 over, we have x plus 9 equals y squared. Now that, from your experience in pre-calculus, is a parabola. And because the y is squared, it is opening to the side. The vertex is at x equals negative 9, y equals 0. But we don't get the entire curve. We've constrained ourselves to an interval from t equals negative 1 to t equals 3. That means we start at t equals negative 1, that's y equals negative 1. We start at this point. And we increase t, and hence y, until we get to t equals 3, which puts us right here. So we really only get a portion of the curve, and it's traversed in this direction, starting at this point and ending at this point. If I give you the parameterization, x equals 5 cosine t, y equals 3 sine t, what kind of curve is this? We can eliminate the parameter as follows. x divided by 5 is cosine of t, y divided by 3 is sine t. If we square both sides on these equations and then add what results, we have x squared over 25 plus y squared over 9 equals cosine squared plus sine squared, which is 1. This is an ellipse. From your experience in pre-calculus, you know that this goes out to positive 5 and negative 5 on the x, positive 3 and negative 3 on the y. What is more, it starts at t equals 0 at the point 5, 0, right here. And as t goes into the first quadrant, x and y are both positive, placing the points in the first quadrant. And hence, this curve is traversed in a counterclockwise fashion around the origin. If I ask you to parametrize an ellipse, say x squared over 16 plus y squared over 9 equals 1, you should write down immediately x equals 4 cosine t, y equals 3 sine t. Parametrizing ellipses and circles is based upon the standard Pythagorean identity. What if I ask you to parametrize x squared over 25 minus y squared over 9 equals 1? This is no longer an ellipse. This is a hyperbola. To parametrize the hyperbola, we need to use an identity where we subtract and get 1. You might recall, and you might not recall, the identity 1 plus tangent squared theta equals secant squared theta. Let's assume that you don't remember this identity, but you do know an identity that re does relate tangent and secant. If we write down the usual Pythagorean identity, 
we can divide everything in sight by cosine squared theta. And this identity results. 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared. Now you may not remember this identity, but I do expect you to be able to derive it whenever you need it. We'll need the identity secant squared theta minus tangent squared theta equals 1. This will make a good parameterization. x equals 5 secant t, y equals 3, tangent t. Now, before, when we had an ellipse, we had a cosine and a sine, and we were able to switch them, sine and cosine, and that's because addition is commutative. Subtraction is not commutative, which means you can't call this tangent and this one secant. That would give you a negative one and not a positive one. Some of you may have thought of another identity that might have handled the last situation. You know that hyperbolic cosine squared theta minus hyperbolic sine squared theta is equal to 1. So we might have, if we had started out with x squared over 25 minus y squared over 9 equals 1, we might have tried x equals 5 cosh t, y equals 3 cinch t as a parameterization. That's all nice and good, except, let's see, in plotting this, hyperbola, you can see that hyperbolic cosine is never negative. Cosh, after all, is e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2, and hence bigger than 0. That means these x-coordinates are always positive, so you're only getting half of the parabola and not the left half with this parameterization. The other parameterization gives you both sides. We've seen how to parameterize ellipses and hyperbolas. You might be wondering, what about parabolas? If I have y equals some quadratic ax squared plus bx plus c. There's an easy way to parameterize these. x equals t, y equals at squared plus bt plus c. Since as t increases, x increases, whatever parabola this gives you will be parameterized in such a way as you sweep it out from left to right. This works slightly more generally. If you have a function that is expressed as y equals f of x, you can parameterize it by setting x equals t, y equals f of t, and it will progress as t goes from left to right. I want to talk about the cycloid curve. If you have a tire that's rolling down the road, the cycloid curve is the path of a point on the tire as the tire rolls down the road. So let's derive a parametric representation for this cycloid curve. I'll start, I'll progress through three steps, starting with the wheel buried up to its axle and just spinning in place like this. If the radius of the wheel is big R, then a parameterization of a wheel that's just spinning in mud up to its axles is going to be R sine t, y equals R cosine t. Remember how this representation starts it off here and makes it spin around the origin in a clockwise fashion. In the second step out of three, we're going to put the wheel on the surface of the ground with the point in question starting at the top and rotating around in a, counter, in a clockwise fashion. 
The only difference between this and the previous case is now the axle is been moved, has been moved up. That gives you the same x as before, but the y is translated r units up. The third step sets the wheel in motion, translating the wheel forward, one circumference forward after one rotation of the wheel. The y value will be the same. It's the x value that changes, and it's a different translation at different times. So it's going to be r times t plus r sine t. We're translating it a different amount at different times. And when t is equal to 2 pi, the wheel has made one complete revolution, and we are 2 pi r forward, one circumference forward. This is the cycloid curve. The cycloid curve, if you graph it, looks like this. In fact, I strongly suggest that you try graphing this curve. I'm going to plot the graph, assuming that the radius here is 1. won't make it a difference in what we choose for the radius in terms of what the curve looks like. So the x-coordinate is going to be t plus sine of t. The y-coordinate is going to be 1 plus cosine of t. t will run from, let's say, 0 to 6 pi. We'll um, take the x-coordinates and send them from 0 to 6 pi. We'll take y, go from 0 to 2. and we'll have the scaling constrained. The color will be black, thickness equals four. There's our cycloid curve. And there's something I'd like to point out. Of course, this is the path of a dot on a wheel as that wheel rolls down the road. I'd like to point out that the first coordinate, t plus sine of t, is the sum of two analytic functions and hence is analytic. Remember, analytic means is representable by a power series having a positive radius of convergence. And the interesting point is that analytic functions are always infinitely differentiable. So t plus sine of t is an analytic function. It is very, very smooth smoother than infinitely differentiable functions. And so is the y-coordinate. 1 plus cosine t is also an analytic function and hence infinitely differentiable. These coordinate functions are extraordinarily smooth, both analytic. How do you explain that? Do you see this? The cusp where the curve, where the dot touches the ground and then takes off. This is a point of non-differentiability if I've ever, ever seen one. There's no well-defined tangent line here. There's an infinite number of possible tangent lines. Tell me, what is going on? Both of these coordinate functions are differentiable. This function is very, very smooth. How do we get this cusp? But there it is. We need to investigate this closely. Here we have these beautiful coordinate functions. They're more than C infinity, they're C omega coordinate functions. They're analytic. Remember, that's a proper subset of the set of infinitely differentiable functions. And yet here we have this nice little cusp. This leaves a lot of questions. How is this even possible? To explain what's going on with the cycloid curve, I want to talk about the word 
speed. We have some arc in the plane. It would be kind of nice to know how fast you're moving along this curve. Let's suppose we have a change in arc length. That change in arc length, length comes from a change in x and a change in y. Those two are related by the Pythagorean theorem. At least if these are infinitesimal changes. The speed then should be the change in distance over the change in time, which we can rewrite as change in x over change in time quantity squared, change in y over change in time quantity squared. Taking the limit as delta t goes to zero, we have the following. The speed of a parametric curve which is given by a function of x is a function of t, y is a function of t, is the rate of change of arc length with respect to time, and that's, cal count, and that's calculated exactly as dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. You need to remember this formula. Before returning to the cycloid curve, I want to review a notation with you. Whenever you have a derivative with respect to time, that derivative is, according to Newton's notation, x dot. It follows then that the speed is the time rate of change of arc length. That's going to be the square root of x dot squared plus y dot squared. If x is equal to rt plus r sine t and y is r plus r cosine t, then the speed is the square root of x dot. x dot will be r plus r cosine t. Another notation C will stand for cosine t, and S, a capital S, will stand for sine t. It allows me to write things a little more compactly. The derivative of sine is cosine. Y dot is then minus r sine. Multiplying everything out, we have a square root of r squared plus 2r squared cosine plus r squared cosine squared. The negative in the second term gets squared away. We have r squared sine squared. Note that every single term has a factor of r squared, which can be brought out of the square root. The square root of r squared is not the absolute value of r. The radius is positive, and hence it comes out as just r. We have then r times the square root of 1 plus 2 cosine t. And when the r comes out, we have cosine squared plus sine squared, which gives us another 1. We can rewrite this as r times the square root of 2 times the quantity, 1 plus cosine t. Now, it looks almost like an identity here, almost like an identity. We know the following identity, cosine squared of the half angle, t divided by two, is one half times one plus cosine t. In fact, if we take the square root, we'll get the absolute value of cosine t over 2 is the square root of 1 half times the quantity, 1 plus cosine t. Well, we have the 1 plus cosine t, but we don't have the divided by 2. We don't have the 1 half. We have a 2 instead. But I get what I want. I just have to pay for it.
I'll divide by 2 and multiply by 2 as well. This 4 can now come out of the square root as a 2. I'm left with 2r times the absolute value of the cosine of the half angle. Okay, but what good is the formula for the speed for the cycloid curve in analyzing the existence of these cusps at points of infinite differentiability for the coordinate functions? The answer is the following. Is there a speed, is there a time when the speed is equal to zero? The answer is yes, because cosine is zero at various places. Cosine is zero at pi over two. So when t over 2 equals pi over 2, this will be at a stop. That happens when t equals pi. If we think about the cycloid curve, it makes one revolution when t goes to 2 pi. It first touches the ground at t equals pi. And that's exactly when the speed is 0. So the point on the tire is coming down. Boop, 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 boop. It stops. It comes to a stop and then takes off after turning into a new direction. Boop, 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 boop. Like that. You can see then, if the curve comes to a stop, it's possible for the curve then to turn on a dime and take off in a new direction. And that's how you can end up with cusps on parametric curves when the coordinate functions are infinitely differentiable or even analytic, as in the case of the cycloid curve. I hope then that we've motivated the following definition. A parametric curve, x of t, y of t, is called smooth. Well, we do require that both x and y be differential, differentiable. But we know from our experience with the cycloid curve that differentiability is not enough for the curve to be smooth. It also has to never stop. If the speed is ever zero, the curve can turn on a dime and take off in a new direction. So we're going to eliminate that as a possibility in our definition of a smooth parametric curve. The speed dsdt, which is the square root of x dot squared plus y dot squared, is never permitted to be zero for a smooth curve. It ends up that the cycloid curve ends up being the answer. Ha! It turns out that the cycloid curve is the answer to a couple classical problems. One is called the tautochrome problem. This relates to pendulum clocks, where the pendulum sways from side to side. But as the clocks run down, they sway through smaller and smaller arcs. Now, most of the time, these periods are going to be approximately equal, but not exactly equal. As the period Gets, as the sweep of the pendulum gets smaller and smaller, the period will change just a little bit, and that affects the accuracy of pendulum clocks. But there's a fix to this. The idea is, if you have a cycloid curve, and the one end of the uh, pendulum is a piece of foil that can wrap around the cycloid curve, then it will have the same period regardless of the amplitude of the oscillation. 
the brachistochrone problem is another classical problem that is solved by the cycloid curve. Suppose I have two points, A and B, and I want to get a marble from point A to point B. Well, I could just make a ramp and slide the marble down, roll the marble down. But it turns out, if I want the marble to get from point A to point B under the influence of gravity as quickly as possible, then this is not the best way to go. It's better if you get the marble rolling a little faster to begin with, and then intersecting this point a little, uh, having built up the momentum to begin with. What is the exact shape of that arc that gives you the minimum time to go from point A to point B? And the answer is a piece of cycloid curve. We're next going to talk about parametric curves and calculus. We've already been introducing a little bit of calculus, but in particular, suppose I have some parametric curve, and yes, parametric curves can intersect themselves like this, as you've seen. My question is, how do I get the slope of the tangent line? The slope of the tangent line is still dy dx. How do I find dy dx? And the answer comes from the chain rule. The chain rule says dy dt is dy dx times dx dt. If we solve for dy dx, we get dy dt divided by dx dt. In other words, y dot over x dot. As an example, if I have x equals t plus sine t, y equals, say, 1 plus cosine t, you'll recognize this is a cycloid curve. I want to find the slope of the tangent line dy dx evaluated at t equals pi over 4. So here's what I'll do. I know that this is y dot over x dot. y dot is minus sine t, and x dot is 1 plus cosine t. If we evaluate, at t equals pi over 4, we get minus sine of pi over 4, that's minus root 2 over 2, over 1 plus the cosine of pi over 4, which is root 2 over 2. In our next example, we're going to look at the prolate cycloid. We're going to write x equals 2t minus pi sine t, y equals 2 plus pi cosine t, and I guess we can do plus. This curve has a, um, it's like a wheel with a larger radius than it's been translated above the x-axis. And so what happens is, is that the curve dips below the x-axis and then comes back up, very much like a, the lip of, <clears throat> very much like the lip of a rail car's wheel. The rail car wheel has a little lip that holds onto the rail, and that goes a little bit below the rail and then back up. Where does it cross? After t equals 2 pi, the sine of 2 pi is 0, the wheel will have traversed to a position 
4 pi units down the line, which means this halfway point is at x equals 2 pi. It has to cross that place at x equals 2 pi once, twice, three times. So where does it cross? Well, it turns out if you try t equals pi over 2, then if pi over 2 is 1. So you end up with pi plus 2 times pi over 2 is another pi. Pi plus pi is 2 pi. So this is the first instance where it crosses here. Also at t equals pi, it's going to cross, but that's down here. It's at t equals 3 pi over 2 that it crosses again in this spot. So what is the angle that this curve makes as it crosses? To find out that, we need to know the slopes of the tangent line. Remember, the slope satisfies the tangent of the angle theta that it makes off of the positive x-axis. So if we can figure out these two slopes, slope 1 and 2, we can figure out two angles, theta 1 and theta 2, subtract them, find the angle at which the curve intersects itself. dy dx is y dot over x dot. y dot is minus pi sine t, and x dot is 2 plus pi cosine t. If we evaluate dy dx at t equals pi over 2, we'll have slope 1, also known as the tangent of angle theta 1. We're plugging in pi over 2. The sine of pi over 2 is 1, so we get a numerator of minus pi. The cosine of pi over 2 is 0. And so the slope will be negative pi over 2. If we're looking for an angle in quadrant 2, which is appropriate for tangent, it's negative in quad 2, we'll get theta 1 is the inverse tangent of negative pi over 2, but inverse tangent only outputs between negative 90 and positive 90 degrees. So to this, this will give us a negative 90. We need to add 180 degrees to get us back into quadrant 2. To get the second slope, we evaluate 3 pi over 2. The sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. Negative, negative is positive. We'll have a numerator of pi. The cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. And so we end up with pi over 2 as the tangent of theta 2. Theta 2 is then the inverse tangent of pi over 2. My calculator tells me that this first angle is about 57.5 degrees. The second angle, notice that the um, negative come, come out because inverse tangent is odd, so you get the negative of 57.5. If you add 180 to that, The other angle is going to be 122.5 degrees. The angle that we seek is the difference between these two, uh, theta 1 minus theta 2. So theta 1 minus theta 2 is... about 65 degrees. I next want to discuss arc length. If you have some curve in the plane, can you figure out its total length?
It's based upon the speed formula that we had earlier, change in distance over change in time as you move along the curve. You'll have these little infinitesimal distances and these little infinitesimal times, which we already know is the square root of x dot squared plus y dot squared. It should make sense to you that the distance function should be the integral of the speed in this way. The distance that you move along the curve is going to be the integral from some t initial to t final of the square root of x dot squared plus y dot squared all times dt. This is the distance formula for parametric curves. Let's do an example where you already know the answer. Let's suppose that I have the parametric curve x equals r cosine t, y equals r sine t. This is a circle of radius big R. So we know that if t goes from 0 to 2 pi, then the total distance should be 2 pi r. Let's check this. We'll integrate from 0 to 2 pi the square root of x dot squared plus y dot squared times dt. Here I'm using a capital S to represent sine and a capital C to represent cosine. When I take the derivative of r cosine t, I get negative r sine t. And when I take the derivative of r sine t, I get r cosine t. We'll have the square root of r squared sine squared plus r squared cosine squared. r squared can come out as just an r. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So we're just integrating from 0 to 2 pi r dt, where r is constant. It follows immediately the total distance is 2 pi r. In my next example, I'm going to have the epicyclic x equals, let's say, 7 cosine of t plus cosine of 7t. y is going to be 7 sine of t plus the sine of 7t. You should go ahead and plot this on your graphing calculators. Make sure your graphing calculator is in parametric mode. The curve should look something like this. It's like a wheel rolling on a wheel. By the way, epicycloids were classically one of the solutions astronomers made to the positions of the various planets as they observed them in the night sky. They knew for some time, for millennia, that they didn't seem to go in nice little circles through the sky or through the, the night sky. So they could only think that they must go on circles on circles. Objects in the night sky must be perfect since they're not on Earth and contaminated with wickedness. And hence they have to go on a perfect arc. The only perfect arcs are straight lines and straight arcs of circles. So they reasoned that if the planets weren't moving on perfect circles, they had to be moving on circles, rolling on circles. They called these epicycles, and this is an example of an epicycle. What I want to know is, how long is it? To calculate the length, I first need to calculate x dot, negative 7 sine t minus 7 sine of 7t, where this 7 comes from the chain rule. Notice we can factor this negative 7 out. 
On the next row, we're going to have 7 cosine t plus 7 cosine of 7t. And again, we can factor a 7 out. Calculating x dot squared plus y dot squared, we'll have 49 on both of these that we can factor out. Squaring what's left over, we'll have sine squared plus 2 sine times the sine of 7t plus the sine of 7t squared plus cosine squared plus 2 cosine cosine 7t plus cosine 7t squared. Simplifying, we have 49 sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Another sine squared plus cosine squared is another 1. Then we're going to have 2 times the quantity cosine t cosine 7t plus sine t sine 7t. And this looks like the difference of angle identity for cosine. We can factor a 2 out. We'll have 2 times 49, which is what, 98? Seven t minus t is six t. Now, what remains looks an awful lot like a half angle identity. Recall that cosine squared t over two is one half times one plus cosine of t. We're just missing the divided by two, so we'll multiply by two. I'll write this as four times 49 now. We'll have 4 times 49, both of those perfect squares, so that when we take the square root, we can bring them out immediately, times cosine squared of 3t. We see then that the speed is the square root of this quantity. 2 times 7 is 14. And then the square root, what's the square root of x squared? The absolute value of x. Don't forget that absolute value. We get the absolute value of the cosine of 3t. Now we said earlier that arc length is the integral of speed. So to find the arc length, we integrate from 0 to 2 pi. 14 times the absolute value of the cosine of 3t. Recall that if you have the cosine of bt, then the period is 2 pi divided by b. In this case, we have a period of 2 pi divided by 3. For the cosine curve, If the period is 2 pi over 3, pi over 3 gets you halfway. Pi over 6 is the first part that's positive. My idea is that if we integrate from 0 to pi over 6, this will be positive on this interval, and we can ignore the absolute values. The only difference in adding up these other parts is to just take this integral and multiply it by 4 for each period. And between 0 and 2 pi, we're going to have 3 periods. So we'll integrate to pi over 6 and multiply by 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 3 periods. Notice how accounting for the absolute value is critical in the solution to this problem. If we had just left the absolute value off and integrated from 0 to 2 pi, the answer we would have found would be zero, and that's absurd. So, we have 12 times 14, and the integral of cosine is sine of 3t divided by 3, 
we're evaluating from zero to pi over six. I always advocate canceling first when possible because then the numbers get smaller. We have 40 and 16 is what, 56? The sine of three times pi over six is the sine of pi over two minus the sine of zero, which is zero. The sine of pi over two is one. So the answer is 56.